Hello, and welcome to the fourth and final video in the Princeton Festival's video lecture series on Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's Le Nozze di Figaro. In this final video, we're going to explore the topic of Mozart and beauty. Now, what is beautiful music? That's the kind of question that paints you into a corner pretty quickly as you attempt to answer it. It's a highly individual response and often highly subjective. And yet, there are several moments in this opera that audiences and commenters time and time again return to to invoke the idea of Mozart and beautiful music. Now, the question then is maybe not what is beautiful music, but rather, what is Mozart about? when Mozart is writing beautiful music. So in this video, we're going to look at just a few of those key moments that commenters throughout the centuries have highlighted and talk about how Mozart is putting these together and how these moments of beauty operate in the broader context of the opera and the drama. So as I noted, the question is not so much what is the beautiful music in Mozart's opera, but rather what is Mozart about when he is composing what we hear is what we hear as beautiful music. Uh, the idea of beauty in Mozart is again something that scholars and critics have written about a long time. So, what is it that is particularly beautiful about Mozart's music as opposed to other um, other composers' musics? For me, it's about uh, the sort of surprise that it it catches you with. It catches you off your guard, and it sort of removes you from your particular location or mind into a separate space, which is a large part of what the beautiful music is doing in this particular opera. Um, it's a quality of otherworldliness that the musicologist Scott Burnham has written about in his 2011 book, Mozart's Grace, this idea of grace being very important to what Burnham hears is beautiful in Mozart's music. As Burnham writes, for the beautiful in Mozart seems to stand apart untouched by human hands which is to say that Mozart's music often seems effortless, that's key, an aesthetic judgment often ratified by what we know of the circumstances of its composition. Human strain or even overt human manipulation, the tooling of a product would seem to have left little mark here. The music seems somehow pre-made and it glows with a self-sufficiency that is less to do with unity and more with apartness, untouched, untouchable. Now that's a very poetic take on this particular idea of beautiful music and Mozart. But indeed, Mozart, in creating this beautiful music, had to work with the musical tools that existed in 18th century uh, musical culture of the time. He's not utilizing any harmonies that we would expect. He's not uh, that we wouldn't expect. We're not hearing instruments that we wouldn't expect. The vocal lines are often quite simple, but it's this, it's this idea of a sort of effortless simplicity that arrests our attention and our ears and brings us out of the texture that... Uh, characterizes at least a little bit some of Mozart's beautiful music. Now, that question then is, why in a resolutely comic opera are we routinely confronted with beautiful music? In other words, what role does beautiful music that Mozart seems to have been able to compose on command throughout his career, what role does that have to play in The Marriage of Figaro? Is it simply the case of Mozart not being able to stop himself from showing off uh, his ability to write beautiful music? or is there something else going on? So in the midst of this incredibly farcical plot, some of the pointed social satires that I've pointed at in previous lectures, uh, does the music of beauty have something else to say? We get an idea of it uh, in act two, scene 10, De Signore. This is in the act two finale. So we're going to explore first this little moment of musical beauty, talk about how it's put together and what it suggests for the broader opera. Then we're going to look at the duet between uh, Susanna and the Countess in Act Three as they write a letter in order to ensnare the Count in his uh, in his infidelities, and then we'll close with the reconciliation scene between the Count and the Countess in Act Four. In the scene in question in the Act Two finale, uh, the Count will ask Figaro, "Do you know who wrote this note?" And Figaro will say, "No." Well, the Count and the Countess have uh, let the Count know that Figaro should know that, and so you'll see the music transition as they uh, ratchet up the questioning. Are you sure you don't know? Let's have a listen to that first passage of this musical phrase. <laughs> So 
So as we heard, there nothing uh, particularly exciting going on. Do you know who wrote this note? Nope, I have no idea. And are you sure you don't know? And the music is, uh, except uh, these little trills and the strings, but it's mostly uh, fairly commonplace music, what we might expect. Now, afterwards, after they've uh, foiled the Count's plot, Figaro and the two ladies uh, beseech the Count to allow the marriage to proceed as planned and listen to their music in that passage. <laughs> And transition into the drunk gardener Antonio bursting through the musical texture with his own bumbling musical passage. That's something different than we heard in the first pass of, of this musical idea. It leaps out of the texture. Part of it is the sotto voce with which they begin the passage, nice and quiet. And then as they hit the forte in this musical passage, you see the texture opens up. Uh, Susanna leaping up to a high G, singing in thirds with the Countess. We see in the bass voice there, a pedal tone being held on C, creating this sort of sonic bed for the voices to leap out of. And Figaro joins the ladies in, in this uh, beseeching of the count. Now, this is beautiful music for a lot of textural reasons, for a lot of timbral reasons. The voices are very expressive. It's flowing very nicely. Now, for Mozart's audience at the time, however, it's also a particularly uh, significant musical setting. It is a musette gavotte. And the musette gavotte, for Mozart's audience, has resonances of the pastoral. As Y. Allenbrook wrote in her seminal book, Rhythmic Gesture and Mozart, this musette gavotte in the second act finale is doing its work as part of the complex of associations which confirms and defines the role of the pastoral image in the opera. So the opera, as it turns out, is indeed about this crazy day and all of the uh, subterfuge and the plot twistings and turnings. But ultimately, in the end, what we'll see in Act 4, increasingly over Act 3 and then confirmed in Act 4, is the role that the pastoral plays. And namely, the idea that the pastoral offers a space of refuge for true lovers. It's a space also in which we see the Countess and Susanna partaking in in order to express their camaraderie and friendship. And therefore, it's this space of a sort of idealized rustic simplicity that we find the characters seeking time and time again as an escape from the hustle and bustle of A, their daily life and struggles. And we see that happening again um, with the pastoral the pastoral music of the Musée Cavat. These are simple melodies, a lot of movement in uh, thirds, as we saw, as we saw Susanna and the Countess doing. Pedal tones, again, very simple gestures. These are meant to evoke the drones of, say, a bagpipe or something like that. And this is all grounded in this idea that goes all the way back to Aristotle, that rhythms and melodies especially contain likenesses to the true natures of anger and gentleness, and further of courage and temperance and of all their opposites and of the other moral qualities. And this is clear from its effects, for when we hear these things, we are changed in our souls. So this idea of uh, the pastoral as mimetic in nature is fundamental to the 18th century conception of aesthetics. So the idea being that when we hear this kind of music, we as the audience are also meant to be changed in our souls, just as the music is changing the characters on the stage. And so when we hear this simple, this simple music, we ourselves are supposed to be brought into this area of composure and this area of uh, the pastoral, the idealized pastoral. See an image of that uh, haven offered by the pastoral, truly confirmed by the famous letter duet, uh, Que Suave Zeffiretto. 
This is a duet that is sung by the Countess, a very noble seria figure, and the mezzo caratere, Susanna. And we've seen Susanna throughout the opera have the ability to move between social registers. But it's here that we uh, see the promise fulfilled of Mozart's desire that these two characters be on equal footing. Now, from the perspective of a farcical comedy in which we see the Count get his comeuppance, this has an interesting effect in hearing the beautiful pastoral in this passage, because they are writing a letter in order to ensnare the Count in his sort of uh, machinations to, uh, to cheat on the Countess. And so there's a bit of deviousness about the letter writing, and yet when Mozart chooses to write the music of the pastoral in this passage, we are immediately drawn into that idealized, that idealized space such that we can't help but feel the passage as somehow more sincere than the topic would otherwise allow. There's some truth lurking behind it that we are responding to. It's for that reason, I suspect, that in the movie The Shawshank Redemption, we see the main character put this duet on the record to play for the prisoners in the prison. And we see everyone in that frame uh, calm and become still, and they cannot uh, help but listen to the beautiful music. It's because they are responding to this idea, this equation of the pastoral with something beyond, with something more truthful than the mundane everyday existence of the characters. So let's listen to how Mozart gets into that passage. very standard Bufa entry point there. And then... And so as they write about this wind in the evening and uh, this sort of nature that draws us out again of the hustle and bustle, we can't help but be drawn to the gentle undulating lines, the excessively simple harmonies. Anything more complex would detract from the sort of shimmering veneer that Mozart is crafting. But because of marshalling all of these components of pastoral music into this passage and setting it on the platter for the audience, uh, the characters as they sing are inviting us into this space. We can't help but watch the characters be enraptured by this idealized pastoral, and we too are caught up in that promise. And that promise is fully realized. That promise of equality in this idealized space is realized later in the duet. And you'll have to watch the opera in order to hear the ending of that. And so in this space, in this space, we are invited into the equality of these, a, a servant figure and a noble figure bonded by true friendship. And if you've forgotten at this point, they're developing a devious plot to catch someone who is himself very much in the wrong. You'd be completely forgiven for forgetting that such as the music that Mozart writes. Instead, we ourselves are conscripted into the imagining of this truthful beauty. It's an artful simplicity. It's very, very much a construction 
and yet we can't help but be caught up in its simplicity. It suggests a sort of naturalness to us that we find appealing. That continues over the course of Act 3 and 4, as you will hear and see when you watch the opera, so that by the time we enter the garden in Act 4, the garden being this place in opera where um, identities are finally revealed and sublimated desires are finally unearthed, uh, and we get a confirmation that we are indeed dealing with the pastoral as Figaro notes the disguised Susanna entering the garden. Notice who he evokes here, or invokes rather. And so again, throughout this opera, the pastoral comes in, and then as we heard at the end of the clip, we're ratcheted or ripped out of that fabric into a different musical space. That passage that we just heard has some similar characteristics to the letter duet. 6838 tends to typify the pastoral, gently moving lines, uh, harmonies that change rather slowly, sustained musical lines below, and again, very simple melodies. More importantly, Figaro invokes Venus being pursued by the god of war Mars, and he in the position of, of uh, the husband, Venus's husband Vulcan, the betrayed husband. He here is having doubts as to Susanna's fidelity vis-a-vis -vis the count. And so as soon as you see him invoke these uh, Roman gods, it's a sure bet that we're dealing with the, this idealized world of the pastoral. This is the space where gods, uh, where fauns are sort of operating. So a reminder in an opera that largely deals with real life social roles and positions to invoke the gods to actually have this sort of Syria element injected into this particular scene uh, drags us into the realm of the pastoral. And ultimately we see the pastoral not just as a tool of unification and friendship, but indeed a space of forgiveness. And again, the pastoral is what confirms the idea of truth in this opera, so much so that it's, it's hard to hear, as some productions do, a sense of irony in the reconciliation between the count and the countess, such as the music that Mozart writes when he chooses to write beautifully, that we have a hard time hearing it as anything but a sincere reconciliation. So in the passage we're about to watch, which comes right before the, uh, the ending of the opera, the Count is finally is believing that the Countess, um, the Countess dressed as Susanna, uh, his... So in this scene, the Count is finally defeated. Um, he has been pursuing Susanna this whole time, and Susanna is ultimately revealed to be the Countess in disguise. The Count now being caught in uh, red-handed, as it were, is forced to forgive in a very compressed amount of time. And the Countess does forgive him. Now watch in this production, again, it's a sincere reconciliation, aided and embedded by the simplicity of Mozart's beautiful writing. First, the confusion that proceeds. Confusion.
So you heard the audience in this particular production indeed laugh at the first moment of recognition as everyone is in confusion and it is a very comedic moment. And then we sit there as the count contemplates what to do next. And then he asks for forgiveness. And he does so in the simplest of ways. Mozart, clever, clever Mozart, knew that he would be setting his audience up uh, with this sense of humor. And then instead of throwing at them more humor, he completely undercuts it with this stark, simple, sincere, beautiful, um, beautiful plea for forgiveness. And the Countess reciprocates with, uh, with the forgiveness that the men in this opera prove too often to be unable to achieve without, uh, without some help from the ladies. And so, as we see in the end, this is an opera that is, yes, about comedy, about great humor, about fun laughs, about uh, hilarious characters, especially the bit characters. But in the end, why we keep returning to it, it seems, is that there are some deeper messages to be conveyed. There are messages about forgiveness, there are messages about communication, and there are messages about truth as built into the idealized space of the pastoral, the space where uh, true lovers can meet and can uh, meet with mutual understanding. And so with that, we conclude our lecture series uh, for the Princeton Festival's uh, 2015 production of The Marriage of Figaro. I hope that you've learned a little something along the way, and I hope that you enjoy watching the opera now writ large with some of this uh, information in your back pocket. So stay, stay well in these uncertain times, and I thank you for the opportunity to share my love of this opera with you, and I look forward to seeing you in future productions or at future productions of the Princeton Festival. So stay well, and I will see you next summer.